So with that, uh, I really want to thank our, our two speakers that um, uh, that will have to lead us through this conversation for uh, being here today. Uh, we have Tammy Patrick, who is a senior advisor to the Democracy Fund, uh, a former Maricopa County election official in Arizona, uh, as well as just a uh, all around expert on all things elections across the states. Uh, and then we also have Benedita, who is the executive director of Voting Works, uh, uh, an organization that works closely with states on uh, uh, post-election audits, in particular risk-limiting audits. Uh, want also to thank, before we get started, uh, Craig Newmark Philanthropies for supporting uh, the American Press Institute's Trusted Elections Network uh, work this year. Um, uh, but with that, we will um, uh, turn it over to uh, Tammy Patrick to, to lead us through a short presentation. If you have questions um, uh, throughout the event, feel free to drop those in the chat, and we will have plenty of time uh, after opening remarks to get into um, more, more detailed question and answers. Thank you all so much. Tammy? Great, thank you, Andrew, um, for having me back again. Uh, and as I get this set up here, I just wanna take a minute to thank everyone on the call for all their great coverage this election cycle. It really has been amazing to see elections covered in a way that I don't think they've ever been covered in this, um, in this country. And your hard work really paid off our electorate and all the news that they needed to, uh, to know about what was really going on. So I appreciate that. So what I wanted to do today is dive into um, kind of the overview of post-election audits and what does that mean? So, whoops, there we go. Um, so for me, audits really start with what do we want to audit and why? What is the question that I want answered? So in the example here, you see this is St. Louis County and they have, in order to get into their tabulation center, you have to have key card access for both a Democrat and a Republican in order to even get in the room. So if you wanted to know who had access to the tabulation room, what sort of audit would you do? You do a security audit. If you wanted to know if the poll workers made an error, what kind of audit would you think about doing? A reconciliation audit. If you wanted to know if the machine or machines counted or worked crop, uh, correctly, what kind of audit would that be? Um, quite often, it's a hand count audit. And really, if you want to know, like, was the correct winner called, that's where the risk limiting audit comes into play. So when we talk about audits, it's really important to kind of first figure out what is it that we're trying to trying to know, and then what kind of audit do we have. And also, it's important that any type of audit is helpful. Um, I think that there are some that are the gold standard. What we all want to work towards is the most robust audit, but doing any of these things as um, is, is often um, been stated by Jennifer Morell, and I'll talk about her in a second. These are kind of steps along the path to getting where you want to be um, in auditing elections. So logic and accuracy tests, which many of you covered uh, in your jurisdictions before election day, um, oftentimes they're also done after election day, those are an audit of sorts. Um, we also know that there can be auditing of precincts and district boundaries and auditing to make sure that voters are placed in the right district to make sure they get the right ballot. So a GIS audit, you can clearly see in this example of the two households that are um, district to the wrong precinct. So that's a yet another kind of audit. When we have security measures like um, tamper evident seals or um, other things that we're doing to say that we're, we're trying to maintain the security of the system, we have chain of custody, it's important that we go back and we look at those things to make sure that in fact the full chain of custody was done and that these things are being documented properly. Um, and if we just do it for the sake of doing it, it's not as critical as if we do it and then we review the information and make sure that all of these things are being followed properly. Some of it boils down to just having really good internal processing paperwork to help identify um, where there are staff inefficiencies or issues to make sure that there isn't anything missing. So oversight of the entire election is in and of itself a type of auditing. Um, reconciliation audit, which is the one that I oversaw for over a decade in Maricopa County, um, is also referred to as an accounting audit. And it's one of the most common types of audits that are done all across the country. Many jurisdictions do this before the canvas of the election. And what it really does is it compares the number of voters that came into a polling place, the number of physical ballots there were, and then what did the machine say on how many ballots were processed. Um, I share this picture because this really can impact the voting history of a voter, 
So right now we're hearing all sorts of issues around um, dead voters and whether or not someone was alive when they voted or not. And the voting history can be really important in this, in this moment. You wanna make sure that you audit that the correct voter was ascribed the voting history because otherwise it can um, open up all sorts of Pandora's boxes. When we did this hand count um, or this reconciliation audit, we always had a pile where we just had to try and figure out what the poll workers did. And that oftentimes included calling them to find out whether they understood procedures and policies, whether they had um, voters that, that fled the polling place without having voted their ballot. Um, we just wanna make sure that there's an overall balance when you're doing a reconciliation audit. It all gets down into the minutia of storage and retention of election materials. This is the sort of thing that, would this be an exciting story to cover? Probably not so much, but it does show, a, have a good backdrop for an exciting story around just the level of detail election officials go to to make sure that we have everything, that it's only eligible voters, and that everything is properly stored, that they are not thrown away. Um, and when we have our materials stored in this fashion, it makes the other kinds of audits far easier. Most people, though, they just want to know, did the machines work? What happened with the paper ballots? So let's talk a little bit about ballot tabulation and counting. Um, for me, I really see it as having kind of two types of audits in this way. There's the hand count audit and risk limiting audits, which I mentioned. And um, I oversaw our hand count audit in Arizona. Um, I uh, had the room that did the, the VVPATS, the um, voter verifiable paper audit trail, um, rolls right off the tongue. And um, it was really an important message to have the community come in and do that audit. We had literally more than 100 Ds and Rs that came together and conducted these hand counts together um, from the community and really got to know very intimately how voting works. And um, very often it's set off with a random sampling of a set percentage of ballots cast if they're centrally counted, like your vote by mail and your provisional ballots, or those that are counted at the precinct. Um, and it's often not the full ballot, not everything on the ballot is being audited. There's usually a random selection of races, and usually it involves a hat of some sort. And oftentimes the hat is a source of great um, uh, consternation. Now, Maricopa County, where I was the election official, um, they just wrapped up their hand count audit um, recently. I think it was yesterday, maybe even today. Um, and so oftentimes when they do a hand count audit, they use either a stacking method or a call, call out method. Sometimes it's a combination of the two. And I mention this because um, also the stacks of 10 counting to 10 being the most common. When we first started doing hand count audits back in, I think it was like 2007, 2008, um, it was groups of 25. And it turns out people have a hard time counting to 25 consistently when they're doing it for hours on end. So we went to stacks of 10 and even then, in the room, there was always at every single table in the in the room, at least one time throughout the course of the audit, they wouldn't be able to um, to identify that they had the correct number of ballots. Because that's the first thing you do, is you make sure you have all the ballots you're supposed to have. And as an auditor, I knew how many they were supposed to have, but they did not. So um, I would go and I would find the stack that had nine or the stack that had 11. Um, so if anyone ever asks if you would want to have your ballots be hand counted, I personally want mine counted by a machine. So let's take a look at risk limiting audits, which is another type of uh, ballot audit. This is the landscape um, from NCSL, yet another great resource on, um, on where we're at across the country. For those that have it in statute, those who have said they can do a pilot program, um, whether it's optional and whether or not um, they're having an administrative pilot program in that state. I mentioned Jennifer Morell, because I'm gonna share with you um, three reports that she's done on risk limiting audits. This is her email address. Um, and she really has been, um, I think a really um, sound voice in this space on how to go about doing risk limiting audits. She was one of the individuals that um, you know, pioneered this in uh, Colorado when they were the first state to do it. And she likes to say that an audit is only as good as the paper trail. So let's just talk about the paper trail. This election, more voters voted on paper than ever before, not 
only because we had so many tens of millions of voters voting by mail, but this information from verified voting shows um, the landscape of states where on election day, voters were voting on, um, on a paper record. And so um, that's without any sort of ballot marking device, although the ballot marking devices are also allocated. Um, so I think that's an important angle in this election as well. And I don't think the general population knows that. And all paper ballots, whether it's the VVPAT that I mentioned earlier, should be part of, of the audit. Um, you'll notice as we're going through and we talk about RLAs that there are a lot of pictures of the dice. If you cover your local RLA or a, an RLA in uh, a state near you, you want to make sure you get the dice in the, in the shot because um, everybody loves rolling of a die. And it's, it's actually what it's done or why it's done is it's a pseudo random number generator which is part of the algorithm that's used to de determine the random seed of what ballots are going to be um, audited. This is a screenshot from a, a presentation that was given by the city of Fairfax um, for the Department of Elections in Virginia and I thought it was just so simplistic and perfect that I stole it. Basically there's two types of RLAs. Um, there's comparison RLAs where you um, it's based on the blind comparison of what the machine said was on that paper ballot and what the paper ballot looks like to human readable interpretation. And then you have a polling um, RLA and polling uh, um, RLA is similar to an exit poll where it's a random selection um, and you look to see if that equals who was the declared winner. That's super simplistic um, background on it, but that's where those reports and what um, Ben is going to share with us today with his expertise. I think it's also important to know that RLAs, um, the theory behind RLAs is relatively new. I'd say it's probably less than 10 years old. Um, and in this picture, you see the gentleman uh, with the beard is Ron Rivest. He's one of the, the stall, the um, originators of risk limiting audits along with Philip Stark and Mark Lindemann is there, um, as well as um, Joe Lorenzo Hall and others who years ago thought of this idea that we should have a mathematical way of being able to determine if the correct winner was declared. Um, and RLAs continue to evolve and iterate and sometimes um, those involved don't always agree with what is the best path forward and how um, an RLA should be conducted. But we, it's important that in this great experiment, we have time to, um, to really work these things out and explore new ways of verifying and validating our elections. I do also think that it's important that um, even though a risk limiting audit reduces sometimes the volume that you need to audit, every audit, no matter what the final number of ballots that you have to review, takes a lot of preparation and a lot of, of thoughtful um, creation of how, in fact, you're going to lay out your materials, how you're going to store your materials, and election officials need to really be thinking about these things well in advance. So what are some of the most important um, aspects? A lot of places start with a pilot. A pilot really is a way of walking through the process to see what is my established documentation? What is my chain of custody and where are there gaps that I need to correct? How do I review how my ballots are stored so I can retrieve them quickly? Um, oftentimes in a pilot, it'll be done with a small number of ballots just to kind of walk through and build that muscle memory. Um, but we need to make sure we're setting the proper expectation for when a real RLA hits because um, a pilot is often, you know, maybe a couple dozen ballots or a couple hundred ballots. But if you have a close election, the closer the election, the more ballots that have to be um, have to be audited. So we need to make sure we're setting that right expectation. So I always like to give some suggestions on questions to ask if you decide you want to cover um, post election audits in your in your area, whether it's national or um, local. So just talking to local and state election officials on what kinds of post election audits are being done in your state, what is being audited, and why are audits being done perhaps in a certain way. What is the status of state law on, on audits? We saw that landscape. There's only a dozen or so that really have um, addressed risk limiting audits. So how does it relate and align with recounts? So we're talking about Georgia and they have a recount probably coming up as well as a risk limiting audit. Many states have not um, changed their statutes so that those two can work together and you have to do both things separately. 
when are the audits done? Some audits are done before certification, some after. Who does the audit? Sometimes it's the election officials. Sometimes it's citizen boards that come in. How does it, what does it cost and who pays for it? Um, is every election audited? Um, some states have decided they're only gonna audit um, federal elections. Um, has there ever been a discrepancy? What happens if there is one? These are all the sorts of questions to ask. And then most importantly, I think for me, is do voters know that audits happen? What do they think about them? Does it increase their confidence in the process? In this moment where all of this work is going on after election day, like normal, including audits, I think it's a good thing to remind people that these audits occur oftentimes in every election, at least some of them, some kinds do, some are only in federal elections or what have you. So those are the good stories to tell. Um, there's some additional resources out there. The Center for Technology and Civic Life has some great trainings on post-election audits um, and what they mean. There's a lot of lingo that's involved when you really get down into the weeds, um, but I'm not gonna get down into the weeds on that part of it right now. I wanted to share my contact information and then I'm gonna throw it back over so we can move to discussion. Thank you so much, Tammy. I think that really uh, kicks us off to dive into some of the specifics of, of these things. And um, we, had, we had a couple of questions uh, from before um, uh, the conversation with uh, uh, folks submitting questions as they registered. But if others have questions as anything comes up, feel free to drop those in the chat and we will get to those as we move forward. Um, but I, um, I wanna start with uh, kind of a, a broader focus before we move into maybe some specific examples and, and look at specific states. Um, but for either of you, uh, just curious, you know, historically, uh, have there been ways that, or, or what, what kind of impact have audits had on elections in the sense that, um, you know, have they, uh, do they more often than not, particularly looking at post-election and risk limiting audits, um, have they confirmed the, uh, the results that we expected through the initial accounting process? Uh, have, have there been discrepancies? How have those been adjudicated? Um, what does that kind of historical record look like in terms of how these audits have been con conducted? You wanna go ben. first, Ben? Sure, sure. <laughs> um, hi everybody, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm Ben uh, Adida. I'm the Executive Director of Voting Works. Uh, we are a nonpartisan nonprofit that works on secure and transparent election technology. Uh, and we have a piece of software called Arlo, A-R-L-O, that is open source, uh, available to all, and that's being used in a number of risk limiting audits to, to help run a number of risk limiting audits uh, this year. So just wanted to give you that, that bit of background. Um, risk limiting audits have absolutely been used to confirm a number of election results, predominantly so far in Colorado. Uh, the state of Colorado is uh, on the front lines of this uh, as we saw earlier uh, with folks like uh, Jennifer Morrell and other folks in Colorado who've been involved in, in this process. Since 2017, I believe, uh, uh, there's been a risk limiting audit in every Colorado election uh, that has confirmed the outcome. And the expectation is that risk limiting audits are going to confirm the outcome. Most of the time, elections go well. And uh, or if there are issues with elections, they very rarely amount to anything that would change the, uh, the winner, right? So the, the key thing about RLAs is they build that extra confidence, that extra, uh, yeah, that extra confidence that the, the result um, was correct, specifically in terms of the tabulation. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think um, one of the, the aspects of like a hand count audit that is uh, looking to confirm that the equipment tabulated correctly. Um, what we've seen in that type of audit, it has not changed, you know, and uh, decertified equipment in a state. It has not, um, I'm not aware of a single jurisdiction that after their audit, they, you know, realized they needed to go out and buy new equipment. What we usually see is that the equipment functioned properly. And oftentimes we need to revise and rethink and reconsider our voting instructions um, and or the layout of ballots because that was more what was problematic. Not that the machine couldn't read within um, the area that the, the voter was supposed to mark in. Yeah, that, and I'll add one quick thing. One of the things we've seen in a lot of the risk limiting audit pilots that we've helped a number of states run uh, in Georgia and Pennsylvania and Michigan is that the, the process of running the audit 
that helps you make sure that you're doing everything else correctly. Are you uh, putting the ballots in the proper batches? Are you storing them in a way that you know how to retrieve them? Are you accounting properly for the number of ballots in every batch, et cetera? Just the process of running the audit helps you dot your I's and cross your T's about the entire chain of custody of the ballots themselves. And that's, I think, the very practical, pragmatic impact of, of running these audits right away. So given that, um, and this is a question for either of you or both of you, uh, but given that uh, fewer states have adopted this sort of uh, higher standard of risk limiting audits, what have you seen as, as you talk to a, a election administrator, administrators or, or legislators? Um, opposition to what, what might be the opposition uh, to c conducting audits of these sorts? Uh, or what are the barriers that states are facing and other jurisdictions are facing uh, to leading these audits after elections? Um, so I think that the first barrier that we encountered originally was that risk limiting audits were sort of a new entity and people didn't completely understand them. So um, we had to go through and learn the lexicon, think about things like ballot manifests and cast vote records in a way that maybe weren't being contemplated in the past. Uh, and so there is a little bit of a, of a learning curve. It's not a steep learning curve, but there is a little bit of understanding that needs to happen. And it is important that there are tools like the Arlo tool that Ben um, referenced. So when Colorado started this, they had their own tool that they created called Corla. And uh, that software helped the election officials um, to conduct the risk limiting audit. So I think there's that first learning curve. Um, it also has been the case that for those on the front end of this, uh, this kind of policy move, have had to do some fairly substantial investments. So Colorado um, invested quite a bit of money in the development of Corla. Um, others are needing to um, you know, invest in exactly what does that proper type of storage of the ballots look like. Um, and so there's a little bit of, of investment in resources but it's also an investment in time because there needs to be a thoughtful thought process. I, I think I saw John Marion is on the call as well from Rhode Island and you know, he spent a lot of time working with election officials in Rhode Island on exactly what this means, how to do it um, effectively. And so it, there is, you know, there is, it's, it's not something you can just flip a switch and do quickly. Um, it definitely needs, needs a thoughtful process, but it's elections, so you want everything to be done in a thoughtful, methodical way. Yeah, I would add um, exactly what Tammy said in terms of, I think election officials are generally very thoughtful and they take their time with adopting any new process. Uh, and in that, given that context, I would say RLAs have been one of the most successful and important developments uh, in a bipartisan fashion uh, from election officials across the country. I mean, in 2016, there were not, no RLAs done. In 2017, Colorado did the first one. Now in 2020, we're looking at, you know, five, six states that are uh, likely to do uh, risk limiting audits, including, um, uh, uh, you know, a number of pilots that were already done, including Rhode Island, including Virginia. And, and that's, um, you want to be careful in deploying new approaches in elections. You don't want to rush them. And so, in against that context, I would say risk limiting audits are generally uh, very successful. I think one you said, you know, what's what's holding people back? As Tammy mentioned, you have to practice this. You have to coordinate the work between the state and the counties, and it's it's you have to train folks. You have to uh, uh, dot the i's and cross the t's on your ballot uh, custody process. So there's a lot of work and preparation to get that done. I think the additional thing that needs to get done, and hopefully the folks on this call can help with this, is that. The first time somebody hears the word audit, they think, uh-oh, something went wrong and now we're auditing. And the point of a risk limiting audit is exactly the opposite of that. It's to say, we should just do this as part of the hygiene of running a, a good election. And getting to that point where the word audit is not scary, is not an implication that something went wrong. It is just part of what you do to build up confidence in the outcome of the election. Um, that's something that I think takes some time in, in, in people's in people's minds, right? And um, uh, it's it's an extra demand that we're making of election officials to be like that much more open, that much you know they're already trying to run as very transparent elections, but now they're going to bring people in, they're going to have this dice ceremony, they're going to do all these steps and coordinate their counties, 
and sometimes people just get scared over words like audit and that's scrutiny that's you know just not necessarily fun um so there's an element where I think we're making progress on that front. I think uh, I think folks are starting to explain risk limiting audits really well, so the public understands you don't run a risk limiting audit because there was a problem. You run a risk limiting audit because you want to build that much more confidence in the outcome. The messaging is so important. This is not the IRS. This is exactly. not an IRS audit. Oh my god, no, that's, not, that's not what this is. This is balancing your checkbook. This is making sure the the total at the bottom is the correct total, um, and. Great. Well, thinking about uh, running these in, in what is now a pretty fraught uh, examination of uh, how tabulation occurred, uh, how states are, are tabulating votes and reporting those out. Um, uh, I want to talk briefly a, a bit about a couple of states that are doing audits. Um, so I want to start with Georgia, um, uh, starting at a, at a basic level and then getting into some specifics because we had a lot of questions about uh, Georgia in particular um, from the audience. Um, so uh, last week, the Secretary of State um, said that, that uh, the state would be conducting a risk limiting audit at a, uh, to achieve a 90% 90, 90 confidence level uh, in, in the results. Um, so I'm just curious, what does he mean when he says a 90% confidence level and what does that mean for what an, a risk limiting audit would look like? So you, you heard the dog bark because dog was not quite happy with that explanation of the, of the probability statement. Uh, no, but uh, I can take this one, Tammy, if you're able please, to. Like, yeah. Please do. I think you uh, probably have this one better than I am. <laughs> um, so it's a little bit subtle, but I'm going to try to explain what, uh, uh, what, what was being described uh, in Georgia and a lot of other states that are looking at doing risk limiting audits are using the same approach. And that is a 10% risk limit. And the way to think about that is um, if everything went well, great, everything went well. If the tabulator did not declare the right winner, so if the tabulator made a significant mistake and declared the wrong winner, the risk limit is the probability that the audit will fail to catch that, right? So assume that things went poorly and the wrong winner was declared by the tabulator. It could be any number of reasons, right? But that's already an unlikely situation. In that unlikely situation that the tabulator didn't do its job, a 10% risk limit means you have at least a 90% chance that the risk limiting audit will catch it, if not higher, right? So that's what that means. Great, uh, I think that's an important statistical point that uh, to emphasize that maybe the public and including- It's subtle, it's subtle right. to get across, right? But it, it's, it, it is, because it, it, you know, a risk limit, a risk limiting audit is not going to confirm that something was a landslide or confirm that something was close. The risk limiting audit is just building confidence that the correct winner of the tabulation process was declared. I'm not going to tell you how big the margin is or anything like that. Um, and if, if the wrong winner was declared, then it has a high probability of, of making you aware of that. So sticking with, with Georgia, uh, 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 there are quite some quite uh, close races, relatively speaking. Uh, uh, in that state, how does how does the the closeness of a margin of victory influence how a, a risk limiting audit is conducted? Right. So I won't get into too many specifics on Georgia because we are there to assist them, and they are the ones who announce you know the the decisions they make. So uh, I believe they've scheduled uh, a public uh, session tomorrow where they will be uh, talking about more details about the audit, and I encourage folks who are interested to watch that. Conceptually speaking. The tighter the margin announced by the tabulator, the more ballots you have to look at in a risk limiting audit to be able to confirm that. And there are different flavors of risk limiting audits, by the way. So there are some flavors that are really nicely adapted to um, almost entirely vote by mail states like Colorado, uh, which can do uh, the ballot comparison audit that uh, Tammy uh, mentioned. Uh, and then there are states uh, like Georgia where that's a little uh, more difficult because of in-person voting and precinct scanners and whatnot. And so it is the ballot polling approach that is used currently uh, in those situations. Um, and uh, it does mean that if the margin is very tight, then the number of ballots to look at is pretty large. And again, conceptually speaking, what that means is if the margin is super, super tight, an RLA becomes 
a full recount, basically. Uh, and that's actually a really important concept to understand about an RLA, is that it is a way to very quickly and efficiently get to the same kind of confirmation that a full recount would give you with high probability. Uh, and so the, the larger the margin, the less work you've got to do to get that high confidence, right? Uh, but the tighter the margin, the more and more an RLA looks like a full hand recount. Are there, there thresholds or guidance around when a, uh, an RLA might become a, a full recount? Um, it's not, it's, there's not a clear threshold. It depends a little bit on how much, at which point the state looks at it and goes, well, okay, if we're going to look at 10% of the ballots, we might as well look at all the ballots, right? And, and so it depends a little bit on how your counties are set up and whatnot. So there isn't a, a really clear line, but, um, you know, anything, uh, and it also depends on the method that you have, whether you can do comparison or ballot polling. So it depends on a number of factors. Uh, it's, I, I think, uh, I think this year will be interesting because some of the contests that we're looking at are obviously very, very tight. So. Thanks. Uh, and, and this again, is a, I, I want to leave it to Georgia to announce their process and I, I don't want to get ahead of them. It's, it is, we are just there to help. We're not the ones leading the audit. Got it. And, and this is a specific question that, that you may have that same uh, answer to that the officials in Georgia um, might be best suited to answer. But um, uh, can you, do you have any additional detail about how the RLA in Georgia will be conducted? Specifically, will an auditor or scanner audit by reading the QR codes on the ballots produced by the uh, ballot marking voting machines? Uh, or will the audit be based on human readable, voter verifiable printed names on ballots? Going forward, will the January 5th Senate RLA be conducted in a similar fashion? And that's the end of the question. So I don't have any, I don't know anything about the, the, the January runoff because I don't know how that fits in, in within Georgia's rules, but let me talk about how an RLA is conducted in general, because this is actually a really important and, and useful uh, and insightful question. The point of a risk limiting audit is to make sure that the tabulation process, uh, to make sure that if you did a hand recount, uh, you would get the same outcome, right? But you, you wanna do it with less work than a full hand recount. What that means is the ballots are looked at by at least two people of different parties, and they're looked at with the naked eye. They're not rescanned. They're not reinterpreted. Uh, that means that any concerns what might have one might have about the QR code, any concerns what might, one might have about like were the bubbles printed properly? You know, there's one of them a little off. You know, none of that matters. The RLA will automatically correct for that because it's a human looking at that ballot and determining if it's for candidate A or candidate B based on what uh, they see. It does not go back through the scanner uh, in a risk limiting audit setting. That's actually really critical because it means anything that might go wrong in between, you know, QR codes not being read properly, the tabulator not doing the math properly, the, the thresholds not being set properly for how, how a bubble is filled. None of that matters. In the RLA, the process, the process of the RLA automatically controls for all of those factors. Thanks. So I see we have uh, somebody with a raised hand. Uh, so Stephen, I'm going to uh, give you the opportunity to unmute uh, if you want to ask your question that way. Yeah, sure, sure. Hi, thank you all for, for having this. So Ben, I, I and Tammy, I've been talking to people on the ground in Georgia, and um, you're going to, I'm just going to be blunt, there are going to be some incredible headwinds you're going to run into there, and I'm wondering if you can talk about these. The state says, Ben, they're relying on you and Monica to tell them what to do. The Trump organizers say, that they had no confidence in the risk limiting audit you did in Fulton County in June because you looked at less than 30 ballots. The state says they're gonna look at a down ballot race that is a statewide race. They're gonna probably do it with a Zoom call. And, um, the, the, there's, and you're in the business of also developing software for BMDs and all those activists from the left are gonna come in and slam you on that, on that front. So how is this going to be a process that's going to convey confidence? Because um, they're not going to do all the presidentials, where there are wide margins, by the way, I asked, they, because they, they, the local officials are too tired to do it. So they're going to try to pick a down ballot race, do it statewide, and claim that it's that slice of the pie validates the rest of the system. Aren't you a little worried that this is kind of like you're heading into a hurricane here? 
I mean, I'm just being really as clear as I can be. And this comes from me talking to people who are Trump organizers, people on the left. And by the way, people like David Jefferson, who claimed that the uh, verified voting, that the June RLA overclaimed, that was his verb, about the confidence of the system. So this, you know, you're heading into this next week. So I just, yeah. You know, no, I, I, pre I, I appreciate the, the, the question. I think what we have always tried to do at Voting Works and in the work that we've done is to be very clear about what an RLA does and what an RLA does not do, right? The claims about the pilot looking at only a handful of ballots, it's a pilot. We were looking at a contest that had a very large margin uh, for the sake of running the process, right? Because the hard part about the risk limiting audit these days is less the math. The math thankfully has been worked out by fantastic mathematicians over more than a decade. And that math is settled, right? The hard part is making sure that the folks on the ground know how to retrieve a ballot from the right batch, how to make sure you label the batch so that you know where to put the ballot back, all of that stuff, right? That's the part that the pilot really focuses on. Um, so I think, uh, I, you know, that, that's what we were training folks for in the pilot. In this case, I don't know what race uh, uh, the Secretary of State's office will choose. The RLA will be a way to gain confidence that the tabulator declared the right winner of the tabulation for that race. That's what it will tell us. It won't tell us anything else. Um, I think that will be significantly better than what we had before risk limiting audits because we wouldn't have had that extra verification. Um, and so I think, are we heading into a hurricane? Maybe, you know, this whole election feels like a hurricane for just about everybody involved in it. We're gonna to stick to the science, the process. We're gonna say very clearly what we can and cannot do. A risk limiting audit is not something that tells you that everything went perfectly well. It is meant to build confidence in the tabulation of the contests that are selected. That's what it does. I think it's a lot better than not doing it, but it's not the thing that tells you that everything went well. You know, one common example that folks talk about and with respect to limits, the limits of these audits is, you know, Tammy mentioned other types of audits like GIS audits to make sure that people are in the right uh, are in the right district, right? Uh, then there's also issues about voter registration and disenfranchisement and all those things. Nothing, the RLA can't tell you anything about that, right? So we have to be really realistic about what it can and cannot do. Whether we hit some headwinds, whether we hit some criticisms, I expect the answer to that will be yes. And, and, and that's, a, that's okay. We're gonna stick to the science, the math, the process and exactly what the RLA allows us to say, and we're not going to say anything more than that. And I would add, I think that's one of the, and I mentioned this briefly, but it was this very point, um, is that the pilots, it, it is a problem if when a pilot's being conducted, at the end of the pilot, it said, this confirmed the outcome of the race when we know that if the risk limit was set you know, uh, disproportionate so that you would get the small numbers so that you could get that muscle memory of how the pilot is done. So I do think it's important when pilots are being um, conducted that it's explained that to set that expectation of we're only doing, you know, 27 ballots or 500 ballots in this moment because we're walking through the pilot and not just so much that that's what's told to the people in the room, but that that's what's being reported. And that's why for those of you who cover um, pilots, make sure that you're not having a headline that says pilot RLA confirms outcome of race because most likely the way that that RLA is being conducted is it's confirming something but it's because of the risk limit in the way that it's being set up it's not a full-blown fully valid risk limiting audit of confirmation for lack of, of saying it any, any other way and I do think also that some states um, address that very question of which race gets called because let's just be honest everybody only cares about the races that are close and they really only care about you know president maybe senator or maybe you know I was in Maricopa County people cared deeply about the sheriff's race right so um, some states the way that they write their law about their audits actually lay out that you have to have, you know, a presidential race, one statewide race, and something else. Or, you know, they lay out the, the construct of how the RLA is going to be done in a way that kind of gets to that point of what the people really will be satisfied with at the end of the day. Because if you draw the, the race out of the hat and it's dog catcher, people may not have the same level of confidence as if you had drawn, you know, the, the presidential race. 
If I can add one thing to this, I think it's really important to look historically at how elections have gotten better over time. And, I, and here I, I do want to single out Georgia and, and say some good things about them because four years ago, they were using paperless voting machines. None of these audits would have been possible or meaningful at that point. We would have just pressed a button, it would have retabulated memory bits and given you the same answer, right? We now have paper ballots that we can go back and look at that voters were able to see and cast with their own, you know, by, uh, they were able to cast themselves. We have, uh, you know, the risk limiting audit is not coming in and replacing some other thing that was there before. It. It's, it's coming in and giving us added confidence in the narrow way that RLAs give us, but that additional confidence, right? So I look at the evolution of, of elections in Georgia and I say in the last four years, we went from paperless to paper and now we have uh, these risk limiting audits that's giving us that extra confidence in the tabulation. So we are getting better and better and better and a number of other states are making this progress too. It's not about, you know, no election is ever perfect, right? We're, we're never gonna have this magical, beautiful mathematical proof that tells us that the election went perfectly. What we're gonna have over time is more and more evidence that various parts of the process were done well and you know, very occasionally may be an indication that something didn't go well and needs to be investigated. But when you look at the progression, we are getting better and better and better. And I think Georgia's done a lot of work to get better on this front. So this, the, the RLA didn't replace some other thing. It's not some, some thing that we're doing instead of a different audit or instead of some other way to gain confidence. It is added confidence over everything that we've been doing in the past. Thank you both for that. And Stephen, thank you for your question. I want to build a little bit from that and think, um, you know, just, just given that these processes are relatively new, uh, we're in an environment of, of high partisan conflict, uh, and they also in, involve math, uh, there's an aspect that, that is kind of uh, rife, uh, or, or ripe for false information and claims spread um, by potentially bad faith actors about uh, these processes. So I'm curious if, uh, <clears throat> just the clearest terms, like in the past, what have you seen has been most confusing about uh, these processes, where have you seen pushback of or, or false claims about a, a process or and, and what might journalists expect uh, this year, not and not even just Georgia, but but in other states uh, around potential areas of confusion or potential areas that could be exploited by, by bad faith actors about how these processes work, what they say uh, and what they don't say in particular. I'm happy to keep going, Tammy, if you'd like. <laughs> um, look, I think we are living in a time of extreme disinformation, and it is it is particularly tough. And I, I do, you know, one thing I'm I'm really pretty positive about on this background is the fact that election officials around the country have done a tremendous job this year in the face of unbelievable obstacles. And I want to give some credit to the press, too, that I think has reported on this election in a way that, you know, I, there, I had some fears that the reporting would be very um, uh, coarse-grained, wouldn't really uh, try to understand some of these more subtle issues. And I think it's been the opposite. I think I've seen a lot of really good reporting uh, across the board, including on RLAs, but not just on RLAs, including on the topics that remain controversial. You know, there's always topics that are controversial in elections where we don't have the magic answer yet. And I think the reporting has been, has been pretty great. What can we do in the face of disinformation, especially when we're trying to pitch something as subtle as statistics and math and whatnot in RLAs? I think we have to stick to the facts and we have to not overstate the results of the RLAs, not overstate the confidence it gives us, and know that some folks will twist those words and make them out to be sound crazy and you know, there's not much we can do about that except just be very careful to constantly repeat the things that matter. Look, it's confusing to, to state, we had this election with millions of voters, we looked at a few hundred of them, and we have confidence that things were done correctly. That is not an intuitive statement. I get that, right? I understand that. But if you can walk somebody through the process and understand a little bit about, well, that depends on the margin, right? If it's a wide margin, that's why we only need to look at a few votes. If it's tighter, we need to look at more. Um, and, and lead them through that process, I think that's what we have to do. And we're gonna lose some information battles, right? Like it's, it's a subtle, um, slightly math heavy thing, 
that doesn't that isn't always intuitive in the in the in the number of ballots you're looking at, right? So, yeah, it's a it's a hard battle. We're going to try to stick to the facts and and stay very focused on the things the RLAs give you, and try very hard not to claim it doesn't. It gives you something it doesn't. Here's something that I want to know. Um, I would love to know in these states where the legislatures are calling for audits. Mm -hmm. And they themselves have passed legislation recently on RLAs, on conducting RLA pilots, on changing the way in which audits are done in their state. These are legislators who passed legislation that either they didn't know they passed or they passed bad legislation. And what they're calling for now is calling into question what they passed as a law. So how do they, how do they um, justify that? And what's different from what these legislators are calling for now than what the legislation they passed in the last couple of years to implement things like risk limiting audits? Because either they passed that legislation in good faith as a representative of the people of their districts, or they didn't really read it, or in this moment they are taking a position for a partisan political way or reason. And that I think is a story as well, because all of the states that we're talking about, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Nevada are, are all either have it done pilots or are in the process of doing RLA pilots. Um, I think Arizona, you know, has had hand count audits. I think that there are a couple of places that are um, doing RLA pilots this time as well, but all of them have audits in place that either these legislators don't know their own statutes um, or they passed them, um, they passed bad laws. So I would love some investigative reporters to start asking them that question. I'll read that article. I mean, not to put you I'll on the spot, but are there uh, specific states uh, where you would say that this was a, a bad law or a law that- I don't. I, that's the that's the irony is that I don't think that these are are bad laws necessarily. I think the 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 um, quality of the statutes being written can be problematic if they get too specific in what has to happen because RLAs and these audits are evolving. So allowing for the flexibility of the election officials to learn what works best. Um, particularly if they migrate to a new voting system or if they, um, if they have policy changes that implement or that impact the way in which their electorate's voting. So if they move to more vote by mail, they may want to do that comparison audit instead of a polling audit. But if the law says do a polling audit, you know, there's, there are ways that we need to allow election officials to be flexible in the laws. So I think that there are a few that have been a little too specific. Um, and, um, and that is, you know, kind of problematic. Um, but I don't think that they're bad laws necessarily. One thing, uh a little bit related to what we just mentioned that I, it hasn't come up yet that I, I want to highlight as you're, as you're reporting on this stuff. Um, there is a degree of transparency in risk limiting audits that is uh, particularly high, right? And I think it's one of the, if folks are critical of the, of the methodology or the approach, you know, the, the math has been published in the literature for a decade. The source code for the Arlo software is open source and has been available since day one for anybody to review. The RLA ceremonies and ballot uh, polling sessions are open to the press and, uh, and, and can be viewed. Like we, we're talking about a level of transparency on this auditing stuff, soup to nuts, that is really impressive and inspiring in my mind. And I, I, hope, we, I hope we talk about that. There's, just, there's a lot of visibility into this, even if there's some complexity around the math. It's still visible. You can you can ask your you know your preferred statistician to take a look at it. You know that's that's important. Thanks. Um, I did want to uh, address one more state specific question that we had. Um, it's a little bit general, so um, to the extent that you can speak to it, uh, love your your responses on this. Um, but uh, this, this is from a reporter. So, uh, what concerns you most when the state goes to audit Pennsylvania's machines and elections? Uh, what concerns do you have or what, what confidences do you have about Pennsylvania in particular? I, I think they're going to have a great audit. I, um, one of the concerns that I have had with when we first do um, a, 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 an audit like this is that 
And this has happened even in Colorado where they've done it for a while, but you get new um, election officials in. And oftentimes what we're seeing is that tends to be a problem is that minutia of how the ballots are being stored. So depending on what kind of RLA they're doing, if they're doing the comparison of the physical exact same ballot to the physical um, or the, the electronic representation of the cast vote record. So it has to be the exact ballot you're looking at. If those ballots weren't stored properly, you're going to pull the wrong ballot and it's all going to look wrong. And you're going to wonder, is it the tabulation? But in every case that that has happened, it has turned out that it was a storage issue of the way in which the ballots were being stored. And so that's my concern is that the level of uh, of detail that has to go into the storage of the, of the ballots themselves in order to make sure that you're pulling the correct ballot if you're doing a comparison, because you're comparing the, you know, the electronic version of how that machine counted that ballot to the physical ballot, um, it's going to be really critical that the storage was perfect because any ballot that gets shuffled, putting it in the box, you know, the, ba the, the batch gets turned upside down and put in the batch as, you know, in the box as it's being carried across the room or whatever, it's going to change that and people are going to jump all over it. So it's, it's important that people who are watching it understand, first of all, what they're seeing. Um, and I don't know if they're doing a, a comparison or if they're do you know, for some part of it or polling. So the, the type of audit that's being um, conducted allows for a little bit more flexibility in the way in which some things were stored. And the perception there is going to be really important that um, there will be some that will not wait to hear what the reason is, whether it was human error or not. It's going to be, you know, a video of it all over uh, social media that's going to, you know, somewhat purport to justify um, whatever action someone wants to take. So that's that's one of my concerns. But I'm not concerned that they're going to find that there was anything wrong with the election um, in in Pennsylvania. They implemented a new law and had you know expansive change to their to their statutes, and saw a great turnout. Um, I think they really did an amazing job. Uh, just one quick thing about Pennsylvania. It's another state that had a number of paperless touchscreen voting machines four years ago. As you'll remember. Uh, when uh, there were challenges to uh, the vote count in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania in the 2016 election, Pennsylvania was the one state that couldn't effectively do a meaningful recount because they didn't have paper ballots. They do now. And so, uh, you know, I, I can't predict what the audit will do, uh, but I do think they're set up for success a lot better than they were four years ago. Great. Thank you for that. We've got time for a couple more questions. Um, but I want to talk about the uh, transparency and public accountability of the, these audits. Are these uh, open or observable to the public? Who who can observe these things? Is this something that uh, could be shown on a, a TV news broadcast? What what are those transparency processes, or, and does that vary by state? I think that many um, many states do outline the auditing process, as with many of their other processing um, stages as being open to, um, to sanctioned observers, so credentialed observers. Others are open to the general public. And we have seen um, an increased number of places that are running them um, you know, live as a, a Facebook live feed or under, um, you know, uh, in Arizona, they've had tabulation uh, being run live seven days a week on multiple uh, cameras for well over a decade. So there are more, um, there's more transparency there. And I think that that's what we'll continue to see as things move forward. Yeah, one of the things we've done, even in the pilots with states is we've encouraged every state we worked with, in, including in their pilot stage, to make it open to the press and to the public. Uh, you know, COVID provides some complexity there, but you know, uh, to generally be open to the public because practicing doing it in view of the public is also an important part of understanding how you do this stuff, right? And so I think you're gonna see uh, extensive transparency on these audits in general. Excellent. Um, we, had, we had a, qu a question that, that focuses on sort of the, uh, the future arc of these sorts of things. So um, uh, the asker asks, National Academy of Sciences recommended in 2018 that all 
all states mandate risk limiting audits within a de decade. Um, can, can either of you talk about the, the reasoning for that timeline uh, and or, uh, you know, what, what's, what's the sort of uh, future look like for, for these types of audits um, uh, in the U.S.? I, I can say a couple things there. You know, it's uh, the timeline, I think, is the right timeline in terms of mandating it. We might be able to meet it sooner than, than 2028, but um, the reason it, it's important to realize that you need to train people, you need the tools to run these audits, uh, and not all of these things have existed. In fact, some of them are only just in existence now. So Colorado does a ballot comparison audit. Until this year with Arlo, there wasn't any software to do ballot polling audits at the state level, right? There were, there were tools to do ballot polling experiments, but not ones that could coordinate the whole state. Uh, and in some states, you don't have any other choice. You can't do ballot comparison because that requires uh, a process that really is optimized for central count, not for precinct count, which a lot of states have. So you have to understand that we need the tools, we need the processes, um, the math is also improving over time. There's, there's some developments over time that allow us to get to the same confidence level with fewer ballots, which is so important when you have tight contests, right? So uh, I think it's the right timeline in general. And I think once the tools are in place, which this year, 2020, will be the key year in my mind, I think you'll see more states realize, oh, okay, yeah, this can be done. Um, and I'm optimistic for what happens over the next two, three, four years as a result of 2020. I, I, I agree. I think that um, for better or worse, voting equipment in this country is on, um, on a decade kind of cycle. <laughs> and so um, the new voluntary voting system guidelines, the VVSG, does call for certification of voting equipment needs to have the ability for risk limiting audits, and that includes the creation of a cast vote record and some of these other things that you need to do some types of risk limiting audits. So once the Election Assistance Commission um, approves the most recent version of the VVSG, um, then the voting system manufacturers will make sure that they um, their next iteration of voting uh, systems will in fact have that capacity. So I, I do think that as as jurisdictions upgrade, change their voting systems to more modern equipment that has more of this functionality, it makes it a much more, um, not easily adapted, but even um, to be able to do it at all. Because in some cases, their old equipment doesn't, doesn't generate the reports that you need, doesn't generate the information in quite the right way to be able to successfully conduct an RLA. Excellent. Thank you both. Uh, we're just about at, at time, so I want to end uh, with a, a briefer question for you both. Um, what's, what's one thing that you, that you hope reporters get right uh, in the next couple of weeks? And I'll let you each answer that before we wrap up. Ooh. Um. <laughs> I have, I have Andrew! That wasn't good. That was it's a great tough. question, though. It's a great <laughs> question. So I think I hope I think the one thing that I hope the reporters get right is to understand that the risk limiting audit is an, an an additive confidence level over everything that we've done in the past. It's not coming in to you know and removing any any anything or replacing something tried and tested with something newfangled and, and un, un, uncertain. It is all the confidence of everything we've done in the past, plus the paper ballots, plus the RLA, right? That's, I, I, I think if you see it that way, then the criticisms that are bound to appear about, oh, you could be using this other flavor of RLA that would be better, or you could be doing more contests. Like, yes, all of these things are true. And still this is progress, right? This is progress. And yes, we'll make even more progress next year and the year after that. I hope that's the, the main thing that comes out. And I, that gave me just enough time to hopefully come up with something that makes some sense. And that is, I really hope that local newsrooms and local reporters think about how they can take the narrative that's happening at the national level of what's happening in other states 
and bring it home. Bring it home for your viewers, your readers, your listeners. So talk about what's happening in your local office because quite frankly, in many places across the country, it's they're still counting, they're still working provisionals, they're still doing all the things that are happening in many of these other states, but people in those states think that they're all done and that their state you know, finished early and everything's fine. Everything is fine but they're still doing the same work that they're doing in other states as well. And so I think that that's, um, that's an important element also. Awesome, thank you, thank you both so much for that and, and for um, all your answers uh, for the past hour. It's been a really insightful discussion on a topic that is, is newer and can be a bit dense. So thank you for that. Um, and, and a big thanks to all those who joined on the call. Uh, we, will, uh, we recorded this conversation. We will send out the recording as well as some summary notes uh, in the next couple of days. Um, if folks have questions, feel free to, to send them to me and I can direct them to Tammy and or Ben. Uh, but just thank you all so much for, for being here today and uh, good luck with continuing to report on, on this election. Appreciate you all. Take care.